So I'm going to talk a little bit about the moving meditation of Tai Chi and what my evolution has been along my practice and research. Um, I started doing mind-body type work in the early 1990s. I was an advanced practice nurse and the majority of the patients that I worked with in primary care um, were not diagnosable with anything but they also weren't well and I had been taught to diagnose and treat. And so I found that the majority of the people I was interacting with didn't fit into the way I'd been taught. And so I got very interested in, at that time, what was called alternative medicine. And so when I started looking at that, um, one of the things I realized in my practices, I worked both in a primary care private practice and a free clinic at the time. And I realized that the stress levels, particularly of the patients that I was seeing in the free clinic, were just off the charts, as you would imagine, and they didn't have the resources to engage in acupuncture or herbal medicine or get a massage or anything at that time. And so what I realized was that everybody has the capacity to become more mindful and that it doesn't cost anything to do that. And so my interest started to sort of move toward that mind-body medicine connection. And so I came back to VCU to get my PhD and started working with Dr. Nancy McCain, who was interested in uh, social support and mindfulness and spirituality based interventions in chronic illness populations. And so that work started um, in 1999. And during the period between 1999 and 2010, I'll give you sort of an overview of a variety of different studies that we did and how they were funded and what the results were during that period of time. Um, tai Chi is really moving meditation is how we know it in the West. And so it's the use of focused breathing and movement um, in order to create a relaxation response. When I was um, training in Tai Chi at the time, I took the short yang form, which was a series of 108 movements. I took three 12-week classes and never learned all 108 movements. And so we wanted to start working initially with people with HIV infection. And it became very clear we weren't gonna be able to teach people 108 movements. And so we decided to design our own intervention. And so we put together um, an intervention that was a series of 10 movements that could be taught and done as distinctive individual movements or they could be strung together to create a form. And the thing for me in my Western mind, because I was uncomfortable in my Tai Chi classes, just this whole, my Tai Chi master was a beautiful thing to watch, but this like, I was like, that's just weird. I don't, people aren't going to do that in front of other people that they don't know. And so the beauty of Tai Chi to me, though, when I started reading about it was the meaning that was incorporated into the movements. So when I designed our interventions, each movement, I taught the meaning of the movement so that people would understand why they were moving the way they were moving. So Embrace Tiger, Return to Mountain, for example, is about recognizing that we all have fears and challenges and we often suppress them. But if we will open up our hearts and surround ourselves with love, we can bring those challenges to the surface, transform them, and release them. And so people knowing that over time with our intervention said that even if they were in a place where there was no way in the world they were gonna launch into a Tai Chi movement whether they needed it or not, they would remember a movement and the meaning associated with it and it began to affect the way they perceived stress even in the absence of doing the movement. And so in the early work with HIV individuals, we found that this Tai Chi intervention augmented lymphocyte proliferation, so it was good for the lymphocytes, obviously important in HIV infection, and that people were able to use less emotion-focused coping and a little more problem-focused coping. Um, we also did a research uh, study. The HIV grant was actually funded um, by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, what's now the National Center for Integrative Health. This next study was funded by NCI, and we worked with women with early stage breast cancer, and we were doing a spirituality intervention as well as the Tai Chi intervention, and what we found was that there were no significant effects across the measures we looked at, and it appeared to be because of the chaos that these women were going through. We enrolled them immediately 
immediately after being diagnosed with breast cancer, got their initial data collection before they did their first chemotherapy, and followed them through chemotherapy and radiation. And so it was a very vulnerable time. What we heard consistently in our qualitative interviews, because this was a mixed method study, was that women were very grateful for these interventions because they felt like they were proactively doing something that would affect their health. They felt relatively powerless otherwise except to show up to their appointments, get their treatments, and just sort of walk through whatever they were told they needed to do, but they didn't feel like they were actively engaged in their own healing and being part of this study helped. We did not see it translate to the measures that we took, but it was a good qualitative finding. And so at the heart of the evolution with um, Tai Chi, I moved from um, looking at perceived stress, depressive symptoms, inflammation when I came in to do my um, postdoc um, at the School of Nursing. And I kept those, um, those um, concepts, those variables in my models, but I was interested in mindfulness, self-compassion, and spirituality. At this point, this had become a personal practice and it integrated it into my um, primary care practice and have written articles about how to sort of simply think about working with your patients around mindful things and then also into my research. And so my interest has been in cardiovascular risk reduction. That's what my area of focus. I moved from a tertiary model of already being diagnosed to how do you actually prevent the development of cardiometabolic risk in heart disease, particularly in underserved populations. And so what I found in the first study that I did, um, and all of these have little caveats, but just as sort of general statements, we found effects um, that Tai Chi decreased depressive symptoms, and these were women between the ages of 35 and 50 who had a family history of cardiovascular disease. Um, we were shown that the Tai Chi actually decreased fatigue over time. It down-regulated pro-inflammatory pro cytokines, which is a significant thing in cardiovascular risk because inflammation drives that process of cardiovascular risk, particularly in people who carry belly fat. Um, and so it increased mindfulness, which was measured with Dr. Brown's MOS tool. Um, it increased both spiritual thoughts and behaviors. I was interested in, in something beyond re religiosity. Um, people with heart disease do better if they have some belief system that guides. And uh, most of the work had been done around religiosity. I was really more interested in sort of a more global interpretation of spirituality, but not only what people thought about spirituality, but how they used those thoughts to then create actions in response to stress. And we found that both spiritual thoughts and behaviors increased over the course of the study and that also self-compassion was increased. This concept I just love and what I found in my studies were that people were able to recognize when they were having negative self-talk. So they would see that that negative self-talk was there and they would turn it off and go back to a neutral pattern was the particular thing around self-compassion that I saw. Um, and so, woohoo! So outstanding results, so excited, got them published, decided I really wanted to expand this. Um, when I looked at my sample that I had recruited for my study, most of these people looked like me. They were middle-aged women, they were white, they had pretty good incomes and college educations, and I'm thinking there nobody's going to fund this work because we already have a lot of resources. I can afford to take a Tai Chi class if I want. I really need to move this into an underserved population. Well, African American women are not particularly interested in doing Tai Chi, I'm just going to tell you. Um, and part of that had to do with, um, with their hair and that they don't like to sweat and these are vast generalizations, but with some expert input from African-American women in the communities, they said, you need to go watch Chris Rock's Good Hair because African-American women have a value set and things that help them with their stress and the way they move through the world and you need to think about how what you want to do is going to interface with what they want. And so at that point I made the very difficult decision to move away from Tai Chi and to move into more seated meditations. Um, not saying that these women don't want to move at all, but they were much more interested in something that enhanced their own innate spirituality. And so I I've moved from a specific intervention around Tai Chi and moving meditation to more seated meditation, looking at um, meta-meditation or compassion, loving-kindness based meditations. 
Um, and so now I'm exploring doing this work in community members. We've just finished um, two studies, uh, Project Heart and Project Heart 2, and we're looking at low-income African-American moms and their teenagers and trying to figure out what um, affects family risk has on the development of cardiovascular disease and also the effects of resilience, which is a lot of what we see in these families. They're remarkably resilient based on what they've been through in life, and we're trying to figure out how community members want to build resilience within families and communities. And so we're currently analyzing all of that data. We looked at a number of measures around violence, communication, perceived stress, um, history of medical things like diabetes, depression, that kind of thing. Um, and then we also are looking at cytogenetic and epigenetic measures. So we're looking at telomere length in both the moms and the kids. Um, and also looking at DNA methylation, as um, Dr. Kinzer mentioned. And so what we're interested in doing is teasing out how much of the risk in a kid around obesity, inflammation, insulin resistance, those types of things, how much of that is a hereditary component and how much is an environmental component, believing that we can impact that environmental component and ultimately decrease risk. And so what the neighborhoods have told us so far is that they want to train the trainer model. They want us to come in, train their community members to then in turn train members in their community. And they also sort of like the idea of sort of a resource list so that if there is violence or loss or something in the community, there would be a set of identified people who would be willing to come to the family and sit with them and help them through a stressful event. And so that's kind of where we're headed at this point. Um, references um, to acknowledge the team that I work with. My current work um, since Dr. McCain's retirement, I built a relationship with Dr. Wendy Cleaver um, in psychology, and so she's prime, my, my primary collaborator at this point. <laughs>